Rainbow is um, part of my life, as in the purple is. Um, I just got back together for a few shows because I wanted to have a blast on the strat. And uh, that's always good fun. But it's not something I will do all the time. I might do another couple of shows. You know, Japan wants us and a lot of other places, but I'm, you know, uh, Blackmore's Night is really my main music. That's much more challenging. You know, it's, it's not so easy to play. You're playing with an acoustic guitar. Whereas if you play with an electric, it's a lot easier because of the noise and the big amplifiers. Uh, it, it's just as good, the music, but it's, uh, it is kind of slightly easier to play. Because what we're doing in Blackmore's Night is a lot more uh, kind of different. You know, a lot of bands do guitar, bass and drums, playing really loud. And uh, I've done that for a long time, 40 years. And I felt it was time for a change. So that's why Blackmore's Night is a little bit more important than Rainbow. Although I still have an affectionate uh, remembrance of uh, Rainbow. And that goes back a long way. It's uh, the same as Deep Purple. Nostalgia is important. You know, we all listen to the Beatles, people like that. It's all about nostalgia and us remembering ourselves as we were younger. So naturally I have a feeling that people say things like, oh, I, I prefer the music 40 years ago. That's because they were younger and they were having a better time. And now they're older, they have all sorts of problems, health problems, things aren't so good. But the music's still there. And uh, I like the band, Ronnie Romero is a great singer. That started because one night we would, it was about two in the morning, and Candice said to me, what do you think of this singer on YouTube? And I said, look, I'm not really interested. I want to go to bed, I'm tired. And she played it, and I went, wow, he's really good. Who's that? She said, the name's Ronnie Romero. And he was doing a, a Dio song, I think, Rainbow in the Dark, or something like that. So I said, play some more of that. I said, that's pretty good, what he's doing. And uh, she played some more, and I went, he's really good. Then I started thinking, maybe I should do some dates with Rainbow. Up until then, I had not really taken it seriously. I don't want to go back and just play the same guys and play the same music. I've done that. But this was more refreshing and exciting. So, I listened to a couple more tracks by Ronnie Romero, and they were fantastic. I said, we've got to get hold of this guy and see what he thinks about 
actually doing some rainbow stuff. So we called him up. I think Candice sent him an email. And I'm not sure if he believed who we were. But uh, we explained ourselves and said, let's get together. And um, we got together in, in a castle in, in, in Munich, actually, where we always stay. And he came over. He lives in Madrid, Spain. And uh, he came over to Germany. I took out my acoustic guitar. We played Man on Silver Mountain. And I stopped. And I said, that's it. That's enough. I, can, I know you can do it. And he was very exciting, the way he could sing. He could just turn it on. After that one song, I said, look, let's all get together and do maybe four or five dates. And that's what we did the first time. And the second time was the same thing. bass player Bob because uh, he doesn't like to get paid so that suited me no he's a great bass player very rhythmic he, he provides a lot of support the drummer so many people wanted to play drums on the the rainbow stuff I didn't want a star on the drums I just wanted a good drummer and Dave's a good drummer and of course Jens is probably one of the best keyboard players in the world and he was up for it and I was surprised that he, he was interested and it, again it was Candice's uh, idea she said why don't you get Jens I said oh I'm sure he, he's got other things to do but when he heard he said I'll be there with bells on count me in so and he's such a nice guy people usually that are that good on their instrument are not so nice, but he's a great guy. When I went on the road, I wanted to play some rainbow songs. I wanted to play Deep Purple songs, all nostalgic rock and roll memories. But we had uh, a few people saying, why are you bothering playing Deep Purple songs? So the second time around, we cut out a lot of the Deep Purple songs. 
And that's why we didn't start the show with Highway Star. We started it with uh, I Surrender and uh, Spotlight Kid. And we'll, next time when we get together, if we do get together and we do our thing, probably throw in some more Rainbow songs and less Deep Purple. I, I know what you mean. Deep Purple was always on the road and they hear those songs all the time. That's, um, I just thought they would want to hear everything. But um, apparently they want to hear more Rainbow songs and Deep Purple songs, which is nice. Mm. I would like to do one, maybe one show with the rest of Purple, just to prove that we're not all hating each other. And just do that and go, hey everybody, it's just one show for all the Deep Purple fans that liked the, uh, the Mark II lineup. And uh, that was my idea in the beginning. But when you're talking to managements of Purple, it gets complicated. You know, they, they want their, their money for this and that. And so it's, it's like, not like you call up your old friends and just say, hey, let's just have a good time and we'll play because there's lots of fans that want to hear it. Once you have management and agents and promoters getting involved, it gets so complicated that everybody just pulls back and says, eh, it's, it's too complicated. So I wouldn't mind doing one show with all the old guys, and uh, and that's it, call it a day, just for the fans. It's not something I need to do, but I, I don't mind playing just to show the people that we're still friends, we're older, and with the passing of John, you never know who's going to pass next. And it would just be a friendly get-together. But as you might know, in this business, Nothing works around friendship. It's all about money and business. And unfortunately, we'd have to deal with people that were going to make money out of the deal. That's always a problem. I, I liked it on a physical level. I liked fighting him. And he liked fighting me. I'd throw spaghetti in his face and he'd punch me. You know, that, that's all good stuff. And I think we should go do one more show and get lots of spaghetti and throw it all over each other yeah. and uh, take it from it. That's yeah. right. <laughs> and um, it's, I think it would be good from a, a nostalgic point of view of just showing that we can do it again as the old band. Um, obviously, Steve Morse is their guitar player, fantastic guitar player, and it's good that he's in the band. This would just be a one-off. You know, obviously I wouldn't join the band again and, and they, they wouldn't have me. It, it, it's, that, that's out of the picture. It will be one show. And uh, it might, hopefully it would be fun. Mm -hmm. But there again, knowing Ian and I, we'd probably start fighting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd love to play with Bob Dylan. I mean, it sounds kind of 
funny in a way, but he's the only person I admire in the business. I am, ha having been in the business for so long, he's the one that I, I still feel that he remains mysterious. That there's something about him that I think is truly monumental and he's so creative. When you think of all the songs that he has written, you know, Mr. Tambourine Man Blowing in the Wind, it just, it's endless that a man can produce all those songs. And uh, so I'm a big fan of his. In rock and roll, it's all about friction and anger. With this band, it's all about, oh, there's a couple of our friends in the audience. Let's have a few drinks. And what do you want to hear? It's all friendliness and party time. That's the difference. It's a big difference. But all the time I was playing rock, I used to feel quite angry on stage about trying to get across to the, the people a message. It wasn't about, hey, let's all have a good time. It was about, you will have a good time. <laughs> when I came off stage, people were told, do not come in my dressing room for half an hour because I'm still very angry. But rock and roll is about anger in a way, and suppression. It's not about being friendly and happy. It's about pushing a certain urgency about life. And life is not all fun and games. Life is not about parties. I was pleased in a kind of a sadistic way. I knew that what I was playing on stage had a force behind it, but it wasn't a happy force. It was uh, an angry punch force. And I, I think any band that's playing rock feels the same way. Someone like The Who, they don't go on stage to be happy. They go on stage to push a certain urgency. And uh, that's how I was. Technically, when I'm playing rainbow songs, I have to cut all my nails short. I can't have a long thumbnail like that because I'm picking. Whereas I'm playing Blackmore's Night songs, I have to grow my nails all very long, put acrylics on them so they're, they're like hammers. Yeah. Uh, this time around, we have one month to finish rainbow, one month to get into Blackmore's Night. So I had to grow all my nails in one month. So that's my thumbnail. And here's my thumb. That finally, okay, in one month. <laughs> fi that's it, in one month. Really? Yeah. But uh, it's tricky because you, you play finger style. Blackmore's Night is like this. Rainbow would be like that. Hard, aggressive. And then the, the other Blackmore's Night would be all the fingers. I couldn't believe how many people wanted to see the old rainbow. There's more people interested in rainbow now than there was when we were playing. So can't be bad, I suppose. And if people want to see some more shows, we'll do some more shows. I know that Japan wants us and Russia and a few other places, but I'm not 
too quick being 72 I'm now getting back problems and leg problems and teeth problems you know my ears are falling off and uh, sometimes it gets difficult to play when your arm falls off on stage so uh, I I'm holding them back I'm going wait because they're going yeah we want to book you and I'm going no wait I want to see how I feel after the end of the tour and if I feel healthy then I'll do some more
So I used to play in a rainbow cover band in Spain. Uh, so uh, I have uh, some videos on YouTube uh, playing some rainbow uh, songs and the purple songs. So I think that was the, the deal about it. I just uh, received a uh, message from Candice uh, through uh, Twitter. So uh, the first time that I, that I read the message, I, I, I thought that was a kind of joke or something. <laughs> but uh, then we started to talk about the possibility to make these shows. And, and then I received an email from, uh, from Richie directly. And then Carol uh, gave me a call. So yeah, it was kind of exciting times. Yeah, from the very beginning, in fact. Yeah, yeah, because my father was a really big fan from Richie Blackmore and The Purple, and he showed me the the first albums when I was seven or yeah, yeah seven years old, something like that. So yeah, for uh, for a fan like me, it's a kind of a dream come true, of course, uh, and exciting times because uh, meet Richie and and play with him in the same stage. Uh, like uh, like I always say, it's a, it's a kind of a play with the best guitar player of all time so it's obviously a dream come true and 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 take a dinner with him and take a beer and and be all these days on on tour with him and and candies and the rest of the guys is is a kind of a dream come true of course yeah we have we have a line uh, during the rehearsals but of course uh, is about feeling with the audience and 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 the songs we play. So uh, yeah, I have a kind of a freedom, a kind of. <laughs> so good, Richard. So good. Ariel, ten For the fans, probably the Dio era is the most important era of, of the band, but uh, I really prefer the uh, melodic uh, and commercial era because uh, one of my favorite singers is in fact John Lee Turner and, and Graham Bonnet too. 
Dougie White, I think, is he was a really great job with the last album too. So I think it's uh, for me uh, that Johnny Turner era with I Surrender and uh, Can't Let You Go and Street of Dreams, that kind of songs, is my favorites, of course. Uh, the people say that I have like, some similarities with the Dio voice, but in fact, my favorite singers, they're more melodic singers, like, like I told you, Jolie Turner and uh, uh, Steve Perry from Journey, uh, different kind of singers. So um, I'm just not trying to copy any of, any of them. I'm just trying to sing the best way that I can and, and, and pay tribute in the best way that I can. So uh, I think it's, it's completely different from the people think. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of a trauma. <laughs> Richie, if you sometimes are on stage and you listen to Ronnie, yeah. uh, if you close your eyes, do you sometimes uh, feel that it's Ronnie James Dio singing? Um, no, he sounds better. Better. Okay. Did only you hear it? Only because he's listening. Did you hear it? <laughs> you sound, sound better than Ronnie James Dio. Because I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't here. And Ronnie can't hear it. <laughs> right then, I've got a... Yeah. Well, it's a little bit different in a way because it's more heavy metal, more aggressive. Uh, but uh, we have a really yeah, big, big influence from the classic rock and the bands from like Rainbow or The Purple, Thin Lizzy, or that kind of band. So uh, uh, it's a kind of mix of uh, classic music and more. Uh, modern music, more uh, progressive elements and, and some heavy metal elements. So uh, it's different in a way, but uh, similar in other ways. So, yeah. When Rich told me about the, to record this, uh, a rainbow song, uh, I'm just trying to figure it out which song would, uh, uh, that would be, but the, I think that he shows uh, I Surrender because it's one of the most uh, popular and more, one of the favorite songs for the, from the audience and the fans. I think it was a great, uh, a great choice to make it and obviously it's, it's one of my favorite songs. So I just uh, be, uh, enjoy the time and, and trying to do my best. I really hope so, both. <laughs> I think it's uh, probably... Uh, can be a really uh, great idea to, to make an album. Uh, obviously, it depends on Richie, but uh, for me, just being on a stage with him is a kind of a gift. So, uh, whatever uh, uh, he wants to do in the future is okay with me.
Uh, his manager mailed me uh -huh. in the first place, yeah. Um, and that's actually a funny story because the mail ended up first in this junk folder, so I didn't see it, like, and then I got another mail. Why aren't you replying? Like, oh, shit! <laughs> you know, so I found it in this junk folder. Somehow this Gmail had decided it was not an important mail. Like, but uh, anyway, I, I saw it and I replied and so here I am. <laughs> Basically hard rock. I've been involved also in some strange like fusion things uh, in the 90s especially, uh, but mostly it's been hard rock like, or metal, metal bands or rock bands. Rainbow and Purple were very big in Sweden, so uh, in effect, basically any band that I played with or any guys I played with, they all had this interest in this music, like the Purple and Rainbow. It's like a, so in a way, um, I don't know, I mean, everybody I worked with uh, liked this stuff. Like. This gig was actually kind of funny because to a certain extent I've had to unlearn the songs. I knew the songs before, but the arrangements have changed over the years. So it's like, ah, you have to learn it the way they are now instead of how it was back then. So it's kind of funny. But yeah, we used to, I mean, with Yngwie, we used to play, uh, you know, singers were always really pissed off, but we were like, oh, let's rehearse the songs, you know, going out on tour. And then we just play this Made in Japan, like side, side one, side two, side three, like, ah, let's have some coffee. And then play side, side four, you know, we just play through the whole album. Uh, and the singer will be sitting there like, uh, okay, oh, now we do Demon Side or something. Like yeah. Never re rehearsing any real Yngwie songs, but it's a typical, typical story. We've done like two part rehearsals. First, like acoustic with no drums and just like acoustic instruments and, you know, like to work out the arrangements and then go to electric. Uh, so we've done that a couple of times. Just like, you know, a few, few new songs here and there and changing some arrangements around and stuff. So it's actually a very nice and relaxing way to, to rehearse. Like, I love it. And not like this, like uh, making sausage, fucking, you know, let's rehearse 10 hours a day and, you know, play the set 15 times. It gets like very tiring. Like, so this is really cool. Yeah, you sure? Oh. You need it? After the solo? You need it? I think with a band, this is like, what is it now? One, two, three, four, five, sixth gig that we do. And I think, you know, of course the band starts to mind read more. You know, we, we, we can sort of understand more what we are doing immediately. Like, so that's good. Like. I think we are get, getting better and better at, at understanding everybody. Like, of course, everybody has to be on the same page, but uh, I think it's, you know, it's getting there. Of course, now this is the last gig of the tour, but it's getting better and better. For this Rainbow gig, 
uh, I would say it's like 90% organ. Because this is what Richie was actually asking when he mailed me, like, oh, can you play the organ? Because he was probably a bit suspicious since I've been away from organ doing this metal, like power metal and stuff, which doesn't have so much organ. But I actually started on the organ, so uh, it's a very natural thing for me. And this is a rental. We rented it from Germany. Uh, it's just like a basic Hammond organ. like. It's like how it is. Um, this pedal here is for the organ. Like. And, um, well, in short, there's not so much synth sounds yeah. with this band, but uh, they are handled by this, and it's like actually a computer doing the stuff. So I have it here, and it's running a program called Bidule, and uh, basically it enables you to make this like sort of rack with mm -hmm. sounds like so you can mm -hmm. And this is this pedal here is for the synth stuff. Different sounds like nice. You know. And most amazing feature is this here. In case the computer breaks, I have this panic switch. You like that? And then the computer is bypassed and you can still have ah, yeah. sound like emergency sounds. Yeah. But very often it's working now, so it's a Windows machine, but it's like most of the time working. So. That's the equipment for you. <laughs>I don't know. It's 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 sort of like being in a show where you you're telling the story of Richie's career. It's this. I I know I know what's coming because I spent six years with Richie before, and I'm I'm glad he chose uh, me to do this because this is a piece of history, you know, for him. To, people waited so long, you know, it was 20 years. People were waiting. Some people were crying. I waited 33 years. My God. He's Richie. You know Richie. We all know. Rehearsing? I don't know about that. You know, we, sh we go there and have a little something to eat. 
have a little something to drink, play a little bit. It's not the rigorous, repetitive thing that you do to get something to perfection. We didn't do that, but we have a lot of fun. Some of it, a lot of different rainbows. The Ronnie Dio rainbow, the Joe Lynn Turner rainbow, the Graham Bonnet rainbow, all different identifying factors. R Richie was always there, but very different. I really started out as a Deep Purple fan, and I'm very happy to include that's part of his history, so it's in the show. I mean, we're calling it Rainbow, but let's face it, there's Deep Purple in the show, and Richie was the founder uh, with, of Deep Purple, and when I was young, Deep Purple was my influence. Yeah, I'll probably die, and Richie will be 90 years old still playing. <laughs> you know, I think he's like the Methuselah of rock and roll, you know, he's still going. I'm getting older, and it's a funny thing when you play these songs that have all that raw energy of when you're young, like piss and vinegar. And my mind is telling my legs to jump up on the drum riser here. But I look around and I'm, no, I'm not going to do that now. My parents are both uh, musical. My mother is a musician, and my father uh, is a great appreciator of music. So I grew up listening to all different kinds of stuff, but a lot of um, classic bands like uh, Steely Dan and Earth, Wind, and Fire, uh, and you know groups like that. And then uh, I started taking lessons when I was four. Uh, I'm sorry, when I was eight. I started playing when I was four, and they started me with lessons when I was about eight. Uh, and I discovered the first band that really, really grabbed me was Rush, and Neil Peart, Peart, the drummer from Rush. And that just blew my mind open. I didn't know these things were possible, you know, with drums. Um, the next band I discovered was Led Zeppelin, John Bonham, obviously, you know, a classic guy. So I had these two sides. I had the very technical prog rock kind of Rush thing, and then the more of a more feel, more kind of, you know, laid-back, intuitive sort of feel from John Bonham. Um, and then from there, got into like big bands type things, Buddy Rich, Gene Krupa, people like that, uh, Fusion, Billy Cobham, uh, people like that. And then we get into, you know, James Brown, um, what's his name, uh, Stubblefield, I can't remember his first name. Um, and then even going into things, I started to branch off into world music, different like African tribal music is amazing. Um, Indian tabla music, completely different discipline, but the rhythms from that, I try to let everything influence me if I can. So I just, I just try to soak up as much as I can. And uh, it's, it's a lifelong process. I'll can, you know, continue to learn. <laughs> I feel that we're living in a golden age of music right now where you can go on the internet and access music from every corner of the world uh, which you know that wasn't possible 20 years ago so it's it's a really exciting time I think oh yeah absolutely you know I grew up listening to more more deep purple than rainbow but you know all of that stuff is so classic uh, you know, and those drummers, Cozy Powell, Ian Pace, you know, they're, they're monsters of drumming. So, of course, I grew up listening to these guys and being influenced by them. Yes, it's 100% different. Uh, it couldn't be more different, in fact. Uh, Blackmore's Night, of course, it's, it's a longer set, uh, but the music style is totally different. Um, I would say Rainbow is a much higher energy level, uh, particularly for me, what I have to do. It's, it's much more athletic, I would say. 
uh, even though it's a shorter set, it's very, very intense. I think it it would be typically, but I'm I'm really used to playing with him, obviously, uh, from being in Blackmore's Night. So I'm I'm kind of expecting things like that to happen. So you know, I I'm always watching him to see what he's going to do next. that's been really important to me to look around see what's happening on stage and uh, you know especially if there's a band leader like in Richie's case somebody's kind of directing what's going on to pay attention to what he's doing and you know over time get to learn how they move how they operate the types of things that they would do so that there aren't as many surprises <laughs> Yeah, I love it. I love it. A lot of people say, you know, isn't that scary getting out there in front of, uh, you know, that many people? Isn't that like intimidating? Um, but I find that the opposite is kind of true. Uh, like the bigger the crowd, they're giving you so much more energy of their own onto the stage and you can really feel it. So, you know, playing to a bigger crowd just is it's more exciting, I think. Good question, good question. Uh, if it were up to me, there would be a CD and a tour and we would continue, um, but we'll see. We'll see what happens, you know. Uh, we'll see what Richie wants to do. It's, it's amazing. I mean, obviously, it was very funny, actually, the first day when we, um, we had the whole rainbow band together and the very first gig that we did last year. And we came to walk out to do our sound check, and I walked right to the front, and I went, oh, this isn't my place anymore. I get to go back here. And it's awesome, because where, where I am, of course, you know, you're adding to the show, but you also get to kind of see it from a different perspective than the lead singer sees it from. So being able to like look out and see all the fans and how they're reacting to it and watch the backdrop and the projection and, and connect with the other band members, and it's, it's just amazing. And of course, the feeling that Rainbow is, is, you know, portraying and giving out there to everybody, the nostalgia, the amazing songs over the past 30 years or more, it's, it's, you can't beat that. It's, it's an incredible vibe. So it's, the energy is, is just off the charts. Yeah, exactly. So we get to, we, we do our rehearsals for Rainbow. This time we're going to go back home. Last time we actually went right from Rainbow to the Blackmore's Night uh, shows and, and rehearsed and, and, you know, a couple of days before. But this time we're going to get about a four-week break. So we're going to go home, get all the Blackmore's Night ba band members together. We're going to do our rehearsal there and uh, try to wipe out some of the things we remembered from Rainbow. Um, it's only so much memory we've got up here these days. <laughs> um, but then, you know, of course, everything comes right back. And then we go, come back overseas, go into Germany. Czech Republic, um, Luxembourg, and Holland this year. So yeah, go back home, study, come back over, and, and right back into Blackmore's Night, which is great. Um, we have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old, our five-year-old boy, Rory, and our seven-year-old girl, Autumn, and they love it. They either sit on the side of the stage, or they're always kind of wandering around, and um, they're they're amazing. They're, they're little gypsy traveler souls at heart, you know, so they know as soon as school stops, 
next day they're going to be on a plane, they put their headphones on, they take a nap, they watch a movie, they wake up, they're here, and they, they're on the road with us. And, and, and they love traveling, they love learning about things, they love the music, they love being part of everything, and, uh, and, and they've been doing it really, both of them, since they were one years old. So, uh, so it's in their blood, and, and they're, they're both so into music, and they get so proud of mommy and daddy out there. So uh, they're our biggest fans, and we're their biggest fans. <laughs> Autumn is actually going to be on the next album that Blackmore's Night puts out. We have, uh, she, she was taking acting, singing, dancing lessons. It was like a, a triple class in one class. And uh, she came home with this beautiful song, this very eerie, haunting ghost story of a song that we had never heard before. And you know we're always looking for traditional songs or inspirational songs for Blackmore's Night. She came home and she sang us this song called The Ghost of John. And Richie fell in love with the song. And we immediately took it from her and uh, from her inspiration from where she learned it from and we added new lyrics and, and we recorded it and we put it on the next album for Blackmore's Night that's coming out. And, um, and we actually had Autumn at the end of, of the song singing it in the studio with us. But the funny thing about Autumn was when we first, it goes, have you seen the ghost of John? So Autumn gets on there on the microphone and she immediately went into Broadway mode. Have you seen the, and we're like, no, 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 tune it down and tune it down. So she's like, okay, have you seen, we're, no, 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 don't do that. Don't, just, just sing it innocent, like a little girl, <laughs> you know, and she's six years old and she finally just, ooh, finally just sang it just like in this perfect little girl innocent naive tone and it wound up being so chilling and we had the goosebumps on our arms and we said that's it that's the perfect one you got it you got it and she goes but that's kind of the most boring way that I did it like it's okay because that's the one we were looking for it was perfect so we're thinking now about bringing her out on stage when we perform the song live for the fans to do her part, maybe start the song or just end the song with her and have her uh, have her make her little little showcase and just sing the, that song for the fans and then we'll go into it for a full band mode. So that would be interesting. And Rory is a little bit kind of in her shadow, but he still has a, this perfect, beautiful, pure voice. So when you can finally pull him out and get him to sing and the two of them sing together, their tones match beautifully and uh, it's it's gonna be an interesting thing to see where they go we would never push them to see you know t into a direction and say you have to do this you have to learn guitar you have to sing you have to learn. but if it's something that they take the initiative and, the, and they they really feel they want to will be will be as supportive as parents on their path as, as you should be Yes, <laughs> I did. Um, I heard him on YouTube. About, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning, and Richie and I were just sitting up and having conversation about, um, about music and, and about possibly him getting back involved with, with doing some rainbow uh, shows and rainbow songs and things like that again. This is a couple of years ago. And um, we were trying to just think of who would be in the band. And a lot of names came up. We, we, we thought of a lot of people. We had a whole list of people, whether it was um, people that had been in the band originally or just completely untapped talent. And um, I started doing some searches on YouTube. And actually, strangely enough, I looked up um, like Dio era uh, bands that were the like, cover bands um, all over the world. And he actually was in a rainbow cover band. <laughs> so, okay, so he actually was in a rainbow cover band, and then he was in a queen cover band. And just hearing the tone of his voice and his stage performance, it was amazing. He was so strong, he was so confident, he was pitch perfect, he was, he was just so solid in what he was doing, and it just blew me away. I found about two other guys, but they fell short as to, you know, as far as Ron, when Ronnie was up here and the other guys that I looked at, I was like, well, they could be backups, but, you know, like maybe as plan B, but Ronnie was so far and, and ahead of from these other guys. Then I started doing some research and looking on his Facebook page, and he seemed like this really solid, nice guy who had, like, no issues, no problems, no, you know, you didn't have to worry about any of the extraneous kind of baggage sometimes that comes along with, with rock and rollers. Then we flew him in, we met him in, um, in Schloss Egersberg, actually, in Germany. He walked in, sat down, and just sang. And everything he sang, it just it made everything crystal clear. We said, that's it. He's the guy, and this is the path he's taking, and, and it's the perfect marriage of his voice. And he could do anybody's voice. He could do any songs, which was nice. We weren't just restricted to only Dio songs, because he's singing Child in Time with that amazing range. He's singing Joel and, Ter T uh, Joel and Turner era songs. He's doing Graham Bonnet songs. He's doing um, any songs that you put in front of him, he's got it. And he's so strong and he's so powerful. 
and he's got a great heart and a good family and a nice guy. You can't beat that package. Um, well, as a kid growing up, my family is very into classic rock. I've been listening to that my whole life, so I, I knew exactly who they were, and I know most of their songs just from, you know, being around them with my dad. And uh, so, a lot of the music is really close to home for me. Um, my teacher from high school actually opens for them for Blackmore's Night, uh, Tim Kotoff, and they asked him if he knew anybody who could sing and play woodwind instruments, and so they, he gave them my name, and I came up, and I auditioned for them, and they liked me, I guess, <laughs> and so I started performing with um, Blackmore's Night in 2014. That's correct, and I said, absolutely. <laughs> I, you know, I, I love the um, Blackmore's Night and Renaissance folk music, and, but the, you know, the classic rock stuff is really like what I grew up with and what I grew up around, and it's really, you know, I love that stuff too, so it's great. Um, none. <laughs> you know, I did a lot of um, national anthem singing and touring as a kid, uh, and Broadway musicals and stuff like that and um, I did a lot of you know just private work like that but other than that I haven't really sung in bands before. Well I'm so used to working with Candace anyway just singing uh, harmony parts with her while she's up front. Um, I think we're very in tune with each other uh, you know in general just not like just pitch but you know, I think we work to well together as a team. Um, I think we have a nice blend and it's actually really fun being able to <laughs> do that with somebody because it's very difficult to come across someone who can uh, stay on pitch with you at the same time and you know it sounds really nice you blend well. Uh, what do I prefer? Um, well like I said before, the classic rock stuff is in my blood, um, but I, I have a, just as much of an appreciation for the medieval renaissance stuff um, as well, because that's kind of what I went to school for. I went to school for opera and all that background stuff, and I have, I have a, a love for that as well. So, mm -hmm. I like both. Oh, well, I'm used to working with Richie from the Blackmore's Night stuff, you know, and uh, it was great. I just, I, we kind of just, it kind of just meshed real easily. Um, I kind of took the high parts and we kind of put it all together and it just sounded great. Kind of listen to the records, figure out what they did. And Candace and I are pretty in tune with each other, so <laughs> mentally. <laughs> so we, uh, we, we kind of figured it out on our own and it was great. No, he will definitely say, um, sing up higher here, or go the next octave higher, or uh, just sing along with the melody, or I want unison here, you know, and he definitely has a big say in what everyone does, because, you know, it's his gig, and so that's fine with us. Oh, well, that's just amazing. I mean, I never thought I'd be able to do something like that. You know, being in these bands has absolutely changed my life for the better. And um, I've gotten to see so much of the world that I would have never thought I would get to see. And uh, I absolutely love touring. Um, I'm lucky I have a family at home who will support me to be able to come out here and do this and help me take care of my animals while I'm away. <laughs> but um, I love touring and I love being able to see all the things and meet all the fans and new people, new places. And it's just, it's great to have that kind of culture in your life. I think I want to say impressive. You know, it's uh, very nice. So far a smooth ride, so enjoying every bit of it. He knows what he wants and uh, it's all good, that's all fine, you know, nothing extraordinary, he just knows what he wants. Actually, it's his front of house, who's a good friend. We toured together in America with different bands, and uh, one day he called me and voila. I started as a bass tech last year, and uh, 
down the road I was asked if uh, I was able to change position. That's how it happened. Oh, the corporation started uh, three, four years ago. We go on tour with Black Nose Night, and um, yeah, I met uh, Michael, whom I know for a very long time. So we are together since 20 years working together, and he's um, literally the light operator of uh, Black Nose Night. And um, yeah, and he asked me, "Do you like to come on tour? I need some guy help me out with the production management, doing a little bit here, this and that." And I said, "Oh, okay, I've." time summer time no problem so uh, i did it it, uh, it was a lot of fun so and that's how all started and then there was another tour and another tour and then we started this rainbow thing out and um, it was in uh, i guess in 20 uh, 2017 was no 2016 was the first uh, ride with the three shows and uh, then we had uh, four shows in 2017 and um, yeah so we started this project Oh, that was uh, pretty uh, much, of course, because it is a major arena tour. So we have uh, uh, 15,000 seater arenas like O2 Arena London and Birmingham o uh, Genting Arena. So and um, so we have a quite big uh, uh, equipment that is running around with this tour. It was in total four trucks that we have with us with uh, light and sound equipment, also video and uh, of course a little bit backline. <laughs> And uh, yeah, starting uh, planning all this is uh, about uh, beginning of the year. So it was um, January already where I sat together with Michael and the uh, light operator Werner. And uh, we figured out what we want to do in that tour because in 2016 we started doing this rainbow in the background, which uh, was a little bit the old days of rainbow uh, reincarnated with the uh, rainbow that they had in the 70s stage set and uh, this year we said okay we cannot just simply copy everything and say okay it's the same tour same uh, rainbow whatever so we decided to go in the background with a real led wall because we create everything what we want on this led wall and do uh, yeah uh, animated things with uh, old stuff from those rainbow days like uh, morphing album covers like uh, old tickets of rainbow and posters uh, where at the beginning of the show we have this waving union jack on the back screen for the intro for land of hope and glory and so on so we uh, implemented this video uh, topic in the whole production of the light rig and uh, that is what we created by the beginning of the year already and then it started out figure out how big is the budget what can we spend on money and that is uh, what happened in the uh, springtime with a uh, uh, manager with uh, with the management with alec together and uh, then we started out uh, doing the bidding the offers and then we negotiated a little bit and then uh, yeah we had one uh, production company who is doing all four shows for uk the same we did with the trucking the same we did with the backlining the same we did with everything was involved in this uh, big show and then uh, yeah we go on tour in uh, summertime We uh, say what we want to do in general, what is the idea, and sometimes there are uh, some ideas coming from Richie when he said, oh, when we're doing this, um, would you mind when we do a thing like this, and I wish maybe some photos of John Lord, for example, then we keep up the idea and try to implement it of course everything he wants but it's not a thing that we say we discuss every song with Richie uh, uh, to say okay we want to do this now and then the uh, second minute of the song we started with this one uh, that is uh, I think he is the guy who is playing and then uh, he rely on us uh, that we are doing a good thing so I think that is a good relationship as well. He is uh, uh, an artist who has his uh, own um uh, things he want to have and uh, when you work for him like 
one or two years, you figure out uh, what he wants. And it's uh, for me, it is uh, a normal thing because I have a lot of clients, of course, I'm working for. And, and uh, it is not to say they are special. A lot of people are always saying this, uh, oh, this is a special one. He's very difficult or this one. No, I don't think so. He has, uh, he has his uh, things he want to have. And then... Uh, um, that you have to do that's very easy so it's n nothing special where you say he wants uh, uh, the moon in his artist room or something like that so it's it's nothing uh, you cannot fulfill yeah the the sound and lighting company was uh, located in Wuppertal where I come from too and so I knew the guy and he needed uh, technicians for his tours and so we came together. I did some other tours uh, with, with Frank in the past with other bands and uh, so I started then uh, one year as a technician on stage and then the year after I switched to the desk to the front of house. I was very happy that, that the rainbow shows came up again uh, I worked with Richie Blackmore for about 14 years on Blackmore's Night, which is a relatively small project. And so we were happy that uh, Rainbow showed up uh, the last year again and that we could do something bigger and arrange something bigger and uh, be creative in that way. When I started to work for, for Richie, uh, then you uh, listen to all his music from Deep Purple and Rainbow and Black Mouse Night and uh, of course it's something special when a, when a band shows up after whatever 25 years again or whatever uh, with, a, with a guy like him. That was uh, something special and uh, yeah, fun. In general I, I like to listen to rock and roll, heavy metal, whatever since 30, 35 years and uh, of course, Rainbow and Deep Purple is part of that, and uh, you know the songs uh, when you're interested in rock and roll and, and metal music. So it was not, nothing new for me, and, uh, and last year I started to listen to the songs uh, yeah, more intensive and more often. <laughs> If you know your desk and what you're doing, then it's not that difficult. Uh, it was uh, a little bit difficult to set it up, uh, technical-wise, and to transport it. We had to develop some ideas, but it was not a, a thing from another universe or something. Yeah, Rainbow is, uh, has got a kind of set list. <laughs> Uh, and it's if you have it, it's much, it's easier. Yeah, you have a program in in the desk, and then you switch to the next page, and then you work it. So we have said this, we don't have any. Oh. Song is called Mistreated! First, uh, Black Moss Night, it's always like, do we have six, seven songs in the beginning? It's always the same in a, in a tour, and then it changes. You know that Richie has got a big set list of 40, 50 songs. And I mean, like, two thirds of them are programmed in, in my desk, and the rest is spontaneous uh, improvisation. But like the sound guy, I have to be on the lighting console. Uh, if there are some songs that are not in the set list, or if he changes the set list, yeah, I have to listen what's happening and to to watch, of course, and and react uh, kind of quick, yeah, and must be prepared for that too. So it took us until four o'clock this morning to find out who was talking and on a phone. We thought it was you. We came up to your room. It's Jens. You were going. Oh. 
Nice catch. You were, you were snoring. <laughs> was, it, was I snoring? Yeah, and I thought, well, it's not him. <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry for sorry. We were I, these fucking doors are impossible to close quietly. They are yeah, like yeah. designed yeah. to make it. It's like a drum yeah. or something. Or the draws right. are like any. Bang! <laughs> but we found out who it was. It was uh, Sing uh-huh. thing here on Not me. on the phone. <laughs> you know? So uh, she was told off four o'clock in the morning, talking at the top of her voice, and it kept coming through to our bedroom. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. His walls are like it's like paper. Yeah. yeah. But you had air conditioning, I hope. We also had the uh, boiler over our head. That oh, we we had air conditioning <laughs> for a point, yeah. yeah. What did they do, Richie? Telephone sex? Or how, yeah. How, yeah, they were, <laughs> why was it so loud? <laughs> Some, somebody kept talking on the phone and we couldn't figure out who it was. Yeah. But we found them. It was one of our singers talking to America because it was five hours difference. So you couldn't sleep that night? But we thought it was a ghost, right, Andy? We actually thought it was a ghost talking because it was coming through the window and we're going, who would be up at four o'clock in the morning? Crazy. But okay. normally you don't sleep at four o'clock, huh? No, I go to sleep at two if oh, I can. Really? Oh, yeah. So early? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Are you getting taller or what? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>have paid money, they haven't paid money to see the backs of cameramen, yeah. you know? Because they're, they're big cameras, they were on big trolleys, you know? So the, the whole audience is trying to see the band. That's not fair. Mm-hmm. That's what happened. But now you, you have a, a relaxed uh, relationship with uh, Ian Gillen, for example, huh? Yeah, we, we uh, converse, and talk, communicate. Yeah. yeah, 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 I talk to him. I visit him in uh, the Insane Asylum now and again. Yeah. I go and see him. You know. yeah. So when, when you're getting older, you get more patient and more relaxed huh, with each other? Not really. Um, when I see him, we always fight. Yeah. Yeah. But we, we like fighting. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's good exercise to keep fighting. Yeah. 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 And sometimes it keeps the uh, tension with the music, yeah? That's right. Yeah. We have spaghetti fights. Yeah. One day I put spaghetti in his face and that was because he put ruined my food. So we were going back and forth. It's good fun. Yeah. yeah. But uh, again, when we were on the Thames together in boats, he helped me out of the water. My boat was sinking, yeah. but he lifted it up. I don't know how he did it. Strong guy. But we were on the, on the Thames together. He had one boat with Ian Pace and I had another boat. And I got caught up in all the branches and I was going down. So he went under the water and pulled the boat, the motor out of the, of the branches. That's bravery. Yeah. <laughs> But it's a, a long... Stupidity, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes um, he, maybe he thinks, better leave Richie in the water. <laughs> That's right, yeah, yeah. Maybe he thinks that now. Maybe he should, not, he should have left me in the water. <laughs> But uh, no, I owe him a favor on that one. So now I'm going to try and tune up and see what happens. Good. See you in a minute. See you later.